Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and get started. So as the slide's been showing, I am uh, Paul Spears. I'm going to be talking about Angular Fire. And um, in particular, we're going to be talking about uh, a particular subsection of Firebase called uh, the Fire Store. It's their like real-time real streaming database service that they offer. And we're going to talk about how to marry that with an Angular application. And so um, these are actually the only two slides I have in my entire presentation. The rest of the time, we're actually going to be building up a tiny little chat application. I'm going to take a look at, at how that comes to be. Uh, before I get into the particulars, though, I want to talk just a little bit more. I, I surveyed the class a second ago. Not too many people are actually using Angular in this room. So I want to take a step back and tell you about Angular. Uh, if, again, if you're not familiar with it, it's uh, Google's framework for writing single-page applications. And one of the core tenets of Angular is its ability to do data binding. And in particular, being able to represent your data models directly in the template. That's kind of like the, the core tenet of Angular. Where it all started from was the idea of, I have a data model, I have some sort of view I want to present to the user, and I would like that view to automatically update as my data changes. So that's like the core idea behind Angular. Well, later versions of Angular, they added another core concept, and that was the idea of observables, a library called RxJS. This notion that a large collection of the data that we're going to be dealing with actually changes over time. And RxJS allows us to really easily represent streams of data. That way we can think about that entire change set over time as one entity. And so going over to the other side of the equation, we've got Firebase. And so if we go to the Firebase homepage, Firebase homepage. <coughs> so I have a question. One second. So apparently it will, will not let me show you the home page. Go in like any other user here. All right, here we go. So if we go into the Firebase home page here, uh, we see a whole lot of collection of tools that Firebase has to offer. And historically, Firebase was known as like the real-time streaming database. And that was all they had. Since then, they've really grown into a whole collection. Each one of these little things here is a particular aspect of Firebase. And the database is just one tiny little piece of it now. And their most recent version of that database is known as Firestore. And what it is known for is being able to take your data models that you're storing in a cloud database and provide you access to that data as a streaming piece of data which sounds a whole lot like what the observables in Angular are meant to handle. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about. We're going to take our data model, move it out of our application code, and we're going to now place that into the streaming database, connect it with observables, and if we do our job right, we'll end up having our view dynamically change in response to our database data changing without any extra application code. So we'll just be able to hook up that connection Set it and let it go. All right, that being said, it's now time to make an Angular app. So I've cheated a little bit here. How's that in the back? Is that good? All right, I've cheated a little bit. Uh, I've got a little bit of code already prepped. Most of it, though, is just what you get when you use Angular's command line tool to start up a new project. So I started that up, and I actually went in and deleted some of their boilerplate that was just going to be on our way. And I cheated and dumped in a bunch of styles. So you're not going to see me writing any CSS or fiddling with that. That's already taken care of. And so with this Angular app, if we look through the structure here, uh, unlike the last presentation, I'm not dealing with any Firebase functions, so there's no file system nesting. What you see is just my client app. It's the only thing I've got going on here. Okay, now with that client app, again, we're going to make a tiny little chat application. We're going to have our list of chat messages, an input box to write new ones, and you're just going to be able to see that conversation. Okay. So to set this up, first thing we need to do is we're going to need to 
add to this story the tools needed to connect Angular to Firebase. And so to do that, we're going to use npm, or if you're familiar with yarn, you'd use yarn, npm install, dash dash save, at angular slash firebase, or sorry, at angular slash fire and also firebase. So what these are, what these are is this is um, the firebase SDK. It is the actual JavaScript library that the Firebase teams produced to allow us to interact with Firebase. And we need that because the Angular Fire is, is the library that wraps that library to present Firebase to us as just an Angular thing. One of the things it does in particular is convert the streaming data that Firebase exposes to us as an observable. Okay. So, much like Chris, I've already run this, so I don't actually have to execute that command. And the next thing to do is now that we have those libraries available, we need to plug them into our Angular application. And so to do that, you start just like you would with any Angular application. You head over to your app or your feature module that you're working on, and you register it in the list of imports. And so here's where I would start bringing those in. And now, and again, in hours, I'm just going to be using Firestore. And so I need to come up here, and I need to bring in those libraries. And so what I do is I grab them from at Angular slash Fire. And this location will provide access to the Angular Fire module. And this module in particular is the base module that defines how to connect to, any, uh, to Firebase in general. So all those services we listed, this is kind of like the gatekeeper for all of them. So if you're going to do anything with Firebase, you need this module. All right, so with that brought in, we're going to add that to our list of imports. <coughs> but that alone is enough to be able to connect to our app when you tell it how. And so, next, we need to actually do a little bit more here, and we need to tell it that we're going to actually initialize an app. And this is where we would pass in the config information that will allow us to tell it what app. So, let's go make our Firebase app. All right, so now I actually need to sign in to Firebase. That's interesting. And into Firebase, there we go. And I'm going to head over to the console. And over here, I'm going to add a new project. Thank you, Lance. I'll get you a model as well. Right. And first thing we do is we, we name our project, again, chat app. So I'm going to call it uh, Let's Chat. Dash. Um, DevFest. Okay. And then you basically agree to let analytics do its thing and you create your project. Now what this is doing is behind the scenes it's, it's firing up that base Firebase application and under the hood that's actually connecting back to the broader suite of Google Cloud products. So like all of these are actually backed by a Google Cloud project. If we were to go over to that console, we actually see this app represented there as well. All right, so now that's ready. So we can continue. And it drops us right in. And so again, of course, Firebase has all this functionality. We saw a brief demo of it in the last talk with things like authentication, storage, hosting, cloud functions. Um, but we're going to be focused on a database. Um, and here we actually we have a choice we have to make. <clears throat> now, like I said a minute ago, traditionally, Firebase was actually known as this you know, live streaming database, and it was just the database. And a lot of people built applications on that. And so that database technology is still around, but they've deprecated it. And so I, down here at the bottom, you'll see choose the real-time database. They actually don't recommend you go with that. 
they recommend that you use their latest and greatest cloud Firestore. And the reason I even bring up the distinction is because of the fact that um, it says right above that that it's in beta. And so you're not supposed to use the old thing, but the new thing's in beta. All intents and purposes, just use this. They've got a weird tendency of leaving things in beta for years. So just use the Firestore there. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and create a database. And uh, ideally, if this were like any kind of real production app that I was trying to get started, you would start this in locked mode. That way you have your security in place to not let someone accidentally go in, mess with your data. For our purposes, we just want that out of our way. So we're starting in test mode. Can you go back and change that later? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's going to set up those default rules. And it drops us into this console. And this is our view of our database, completely empty right now. Uh, next thing, I'm actually going to go ahead and turn on hosting for the app as well. I just want to cross my fingers and hope we get far enough that I can deploy the final product when we're done. So I'm going to click Get Started. And it tells me, like, if you want to use uh, Firebase <coughs> deployment, you're going to need this tool installed locally. I've already got it. But that's what you would do. And then again, it just walks you through it. Once you have that tool installed, you're going to log in on the console, initialize your project as a Firebase app, and then hit deploy. All right, so now it's up. We've got the ability to deploy. So we're still on the hunt, though. We're still trying to find the identifier that lets us connect our Angular application to this project we just created. So to do that, we're going to head back to the project overview. And right here, this icon is an indicator that says, you know, click here to learn more about how to connect your project using a web app. And it presents us this JavaScript code that says, here's how you do it if you were just using JavaScript. Again, we're not. We're using Angular on top of that. So we need to make sure that we tweak this the right way for our needs in the Angular application. And so I just happen to know that I'm going to need that bit right there. So I'm just going to have that in my paste buffer, and we're going to take a look at it in just a second. Now, we're ready to head back to our code. So we've got our Angular Fire module here, and we're going to initialize our app, and we need to specify that config. So I could actually drop that in right here if I wanted to. Probably shouldn't, though, because odds are you're going to want to use this application in another context. And when you go to production, QA, testing, etc., you need to be able to swap out that configuration. So really, you should be using Angular's built-in uh, tooling that allows you to swap build environments. And so for our purposes, that's as simple as coming over to the environments TS file and creating a new entry. And converting that into a JSON, JSON structure. <clears throat> and we now have our information specific to our dev environment. With that information, I can import it. So we're saying go grab that environment constant that we had over in that environment file. And here I'm saying go ahead and use the config that was within it. All right, so that allows us to now talk to our project. But we have one more thing we got to do. We got to be able to actually utilize the APIs to talk to the database. And that's a different process. And the reason for that is because Angular Fire is split up into these chunks so that if you don't actually use all of Angular Fire, you don't have to pay the cost in your bundle size. You just bring in the pieces that you want and run with it. So in particular, we're after the Angular Firestore module. And you're going to see this pattern if you keep working with it at Angular slash Fire slash which product category. And this one's real easy. This one we just bring down here. And we plug it in at the end of our list of imports. Really important, make sure you the list initialize app first. Otherwise, it'll actually try and you know, do a sanity check with those other modules and fail. Thank <laughs> you. 
<clears throat> all right, so with all that in play, all I've done is plug it in and turned it on. I haven't actually done anything with it yet. So let's stop right there for a second. Let's start up our server and see what the app, that base application I've created looks like. All right, so now that we're sitting here and you have me on camera, this will be a great time while everyone's watching this load and then Bill, this would be a great time to plug, to tell my boss I need a new computer. That way we're not all sitting here waiting for this. <laughs> all right, so that's done. Let's go ahead and take a look. And it's a really, really simple app. Again, I've thrown in some CSS and right now it just says hello world. That's all there is. Okay, let's change that. I want to head over to our app component HTML. In the Angular world, this is kind of this is the starting point. This is where you first start to build your very front view of your application. And what we need in our application is we need to start off with a title. So I'm going to drop in an H1. I'm going to give it a class of title. And I'm going to call it Let's Chat. Okay, and now after the title, we're going to want our chat box centered in the middle of the page. So I'm going to put drop in a div and I'm going to whoop, I'm going to drop in a div and I'm going to give it a class of center content. And inside of our center content I'm going to put a chat box and I'm also going to put in a, an input because the user is going to have to be able to give us some you know, messages. Saving that and going back to the app. Saving that and going back to the app. There we go. All right, so we've got let's chat. We got our message box and we've got our input. Pretty pretty simple so far. All right, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at what a message would look like. So inside there, we're going to drop a, an unordered, unordered list and a list item with a message of message would appear here. And there we go. Pretty simple. And for our input, we'll come in here and put a placeholder of type your, type your message here. All right, so kind of got, got it all structured out, pretty simple stuff. None of that had anything to do with Angular other than like where I put it. It's just simple HTML and CSS. Now we need to actually connect this to Angular. That's the next step. And so to do that, generally speaking, uh, when you look at your template and you want to convert it to Angular, you look at, at what's on it and you say, okay, what's actually based upon data? In our cases, that's the messages, right? The chat messages. <coughs> And in particular, I want to show one of those messages for each message I have. So we need to come up, come up to our list item, and we're going to angularize it. And to do that, we're going to use an Angular directive called ng4, which allows us to say, give me one of these for every point of data I have in an array. And so I'm going to say, let message of messages. And I'm going to put this async pipe in here which is a particular construct of Angular that says my, my list of messages is going to come from some sort of asynchronous remote location. And I would like Angular to please deal with unpacking and handling that asynchronous nature. So we don't have to deal with it. Okay. And now, of course, it's erring because I haven't defined what messages is yet. It doesn't know. So let's go do that now. Okay. So let's do that. We're going to head over to the companion file of the app component HTML, which would be the app component TS. And now in here is where I have to define that messages, and I've got the challenge of figuring out how to make that messages be a list from our database. So that's what we're doing now. The constructor in our app component is as good a place as any to do this. 
and the constructor is actually where we also list any dependencies. In, the, in this case, we have one. It is, we need to say, I need access to Firestore. So I'm going to make a parameter here called fs, and it's going to be of type Angular Firestore. My editor helps me out and automatically imported that for me, so I didn't have to. Okay, I also need a property called messages. And because this is coming, once again, from an asynchronous source, it's going to be an observable. Now, typically, you would define what kind of data type this message list is. Um, for the sake of time and not wanting to dig into TypeScript, I'm just going to say this could be any kind of data. Okay, and now, with that being said, I can assign to my messages fs.collection. So here I'm accessing the Angular service that the Angular Fire module provided us called Angular Firestore, accessing its collection call, and now I can tell it, please go look in the database for a collection of the following name. Okay, that name being chat messages. I just made that up. We've not seen that before. I just gave it a random name now. And in particular, what we want you to do with that collection is let me look at the value changes that come off of it. And so now that value changes that will give us back an observable of all the data that lives inside this collection, inside Firestore. And it will save it as the observable known as messages. Yeah. Is there any benefit to doing it in the constructor versus NGRNN? In See me after class. I can talk for hours on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Usually, that I put my subscriptions in NGRNN. It, it would it would function either way, but I've got reasons. I'll tell you later. Okay. All right. Um. Let's see. So, from here, we need to save it, run it, and. Right now it's empty because I don't have any messages. If I look at my console, it should be error free. Of course, right? Um, let's see. So this error is unfortunately nothing I can do about it. This is deep down in the internals. Firestore, their API has deprecated something. Angular Fire hasn't updated it yet. It's more of a warning than anything. It's something out of our control right now. So otherwise the app is running fine, except there's no data. So this is where things really start to get cool. I'm gonna pop this over to the left for a second. And I'm also gonna pop out my, my Firebase console. And I'm gonna head back over to the database section and take a look at our database. I'm gonna go ahead and add that chat messages collection. Now in Firestore, this is actually a, a JSON, JSON data store. So it's like, you know, just about every other NoSQL database is just broad JSON-ish that you're storing in here. So this chat messages effectively acts as a property name in a giant JSON object. All right, so there's my collection called chat messages. And now I need to add at least one entity to it, or it's gonna say that's an empty collection, it's just gonna throw it out. So we gotta like make, make one here. And we didn't have to go this route. I'm starting to kind of show you how the console works. All right, so we got a chat message collection. It's going to have two fields. It's going to have a from field. It's going to be from me. I'm going to add another field called message. And that's going to be hello world. All right, and now I can hit save. And the magic happens on the left. So I manually just put a piece of data into my database. And because my application was written to say, please watch all the values inside the database. Oh, wait. <laughs> that isn't right. What, what just happened? It kind of refreshed. Ah, yes. <laughs> um, I need to actually finish my template. It was kind of like magic. It was displaying message would appear once for every message. Not so helpful. Let's actually have it utilize the message. 
All right, so to do that, we use Angular's binding syntax to say for the given message I'm looking at, show who it's from, separate that with a colon and a space, and give me the actual message out of it. All right, let's try this again. There we go. And so now it's actually picking up that data from the database. So let's add one more just for, for effect here. So, <coughs> so I'm going to add another document. I'm going to let it auto index itself, auto ID itself. Give a from. This one's also going to be from me. Add the message. And again, watch the screen on the right. I save it, and that message automatically pops up. Because again, we have that live connection to our database. If you save an object that doesn't match what your template wants, we'll throw it there. Uh, let's take a look at that next, actually, or pretty soon. All right, so that seems to be working great. Um, however, we need to be able to let the user type new messages in, right? So let's go ahead and take care of that next. Maximize that. Head back to our code. Right, so we got the messages displaying. Now we need to be able to let them type and send one out. We're going to start right here. Um, I'm going to cheat a little bit, take a couple Angular shortcuts. I'm going to introduce a, a thing called a template variable. I'm going to name my input. And I'm going to use that and say, whenever the user hits the enter button, call the method that I've not defined yet called send message and pass in my chat input as an input to that method, as a variable value for that method. So I'm literally handing the input HTML element to my method call. Okay, so now in my TypeScript, I need a send message method and it needs to accept the input element, which is of type HTML input element. And once I have that, I can then go ahead and once again access the Firestore API to now send my message. So here I'm going to refer to Firestore collection. I'm going to refer to the same collection. Of course, as you build up your app, you're going to want to make const and other methods to abstract away some of this stuff. But this just gets us started. And now referencing my collection, I can tell it what to do with it. I'm going to tell it to add. I'm going to add a new document to this collection. It's called chat messages. Man, I'm glad someone's looking out for me. All right, and now in here, I build up my data object that represents this particular document. And had two properties from, for now I'm just hard coding myself in. And a message, which is gonna come from our input element value property. All right, so if I hit enter on my input, it should take the value Call this method, reference the, the Firestore collection, add the document, and be done. So let's see what we get. Shh, jumping ahead. Don't jump ahead. All right, so in theory, I type my message. I hit enter, it appears in the chat box. Now notice, I wrote zero lines of code that said when I hit enter, please go update some array locally and then go update my template with the new data in that array. I've got two lanes of communication, one strictly outbound to the database, one strictly inbound from the database, never crossing them in between. This is a really nice architectural pattern if you can use a system that supports it. But like was pointed out, something's not quite right and my input was left behind with my text. Pretty easy to clear this out. We come over here and after we're done adding the document, we need to clear out that message. 
So that's easy enough, right? I can just come in here and say input element dot value equals empty string. Save that, run it. Hit enter. Now that worked. That's great. Our message is up there. Our input's clear. Technically, there's a bug waiting to bite us. Yeah. Do you need to check for an error or success when you add? Exactly. Exactly. What if, what if I failed? What if the internet was down and my message didn't go through? What if the internet's really slow? It succeeded, but was really slow. Well, I would have immediately cleared that input while waiting for that request to finish. So we don't want that. Instead, what we want to do is we want to be able to acknowledge what has happened. So to do that, <coughs> this collection add actually returns us a promise. So if you're familiar with promises, it's really simple to use them. You can use async await syntax if you're familiar with that. Or if you're just doing a quick demo, you can come over here and call then on that promise to say, execute the following when you're done. Of course, if you're looking for errors, you could put a catch on that. <coughs> now, we're not currently interested in anything that it returns. We just want that signal that it's done. So now, I move that one little bit of code in there, clean up my spacing a little bit, save it. <clears throat> and now, you can see a brief delay, and it's working perfectly. Perfectly, right? All right, all done, right? We go home. Um, yeah. That's not going to work. Our messages just keep coming back in random order. So we're going to have to address that. Well, for whatever reason, as far as I can tell, there is zero deterministic ability, or uh, zero ability to like deterministically figure out what order is my list going to come back in by just simply asking for the list. We've got to do a little bit more work. For your IDs, how long per minute? Um, no, they're randomly generated. So we got to do something else here. And this is going to answer your previous question here in just a moment. We need to manually say, I want to order my retrieval of this by some property. <coughs> so to do that, we need to add some sort of marker to our data to indicate like, when, do I, when do I do this. So to do that, We're just going to add a time property and set it to the current timestamp. Is there, um, I know that somehow you can track like created add or updated add in there. Is there no way to query by that kind of stuff? In the um, no. So that, that actually or is. Or is it even tracked? No, no, that's not really tracked. You, if you're doing Firebase functions, you can get metadata about like when the event occurred and things like that back in your Firebase backend. Mm -hmm. But that isn't actually stored as part of the document itself. All right, so now that we have this marker, we have some indication of order. But we need to still specify that that is how we intend to retrieve our data based upon that order. So now back in our app, uh, sorry, back down here in our collection, turns out when you reference a collection, <coughs> Firestore will actually allow you the opportunity to interact with that collection before giving it to you kind of a weird way of thinking about it, but you can say, if I were to have a collection, here's the kinds of things I'd want to do with it. And so right here, as a second parameter, I can specify a callback function that allows me to interact with this collection. Let me finish it and see what happens. And then here, given a collection, I can say uh, collection dot order by, and in particular, I want to order by the time property. Okay, what am I doing wrong here, though? Uh, 
path query function. Path query function. I'm going to cheat. Double check, make sure I'm not doing something silly. I'm going to go back to the working code here. Take a look behind the curtain. Yep, nope, that's the same thing. <laughs> uh, not, no, not here. Except the string. Yeah, like the, even the, the types are... Our documents, our documents does not have tag. Is that the reason? Collection reference. Hmm. <laughs> Something fail. So, when in doubt, we've got a little time. Let's go check out the Angular Fire documentation. All right, so this is the GitHub page for it. Uh, and they've got some of the basics here on the front and example usage. And what we're actually interested in doing is querying collections. What we're doing right now is exactly that. So, skimming through here. Collection, string, callback. <laughs> I, not sure. Does it not like it because you've broken into multiple lines? No, because it was complaining before I did that. And it was fine before you added the callback? Yep. Control click on collection. String query function. <laughs> um, that is so bizarre. The second I go to actually like put the body of the function in there, it freaks out. It's like if we go look at the type script definition, and this actually is already matching it. Yeah, there's oh, like there it is below. It's got two different Yeah, that's not supposed to be possible. Okay, well shh. <laughs> <laughs> Do not try this at home. I deleted the other typing. Yeah, with identical signatures. Shouldn't yeah. And then let's try this again. That's just white space. Um, should have just been white space. Oh, it's the difference between the two is on return value. Yeah. Maybe it's a return value. All right. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right, saving that. <laughs> we come back. And it works perfectly. Well, now we have a new problem. It's that we told it to order by time. And so far, all the chat messages that we've created didn't have that time problem. So we need to fix that. So to do that, we're actually going to go in make a change. We actually already made the change, which was to add that time property to messages that we start adding. So, all right, there we go. We did it. We got there. So, there's our chat application. Obvious next steps would be, like, it'd be great if I can log in on another window and have a different user chat with me, right? Unfortunately, this is beyond the time we have here, but what you saw um, Chris start with on the last one, where she plugged in Angular Firebase's um, authentication mechanisms. You pick an auth method, you can then look at that authorized user, and you can use that and send that along when you add your documents. You take that username and stick it in the front, things like that. And so to wrap it up, uh, I want to try one more thing. 
I'm going to try the dreaded Firebase deploy. You know, this really did not work well a little bit ago. So I'm hoping it's nothing with Firebase. We'll see. And so to do this, I need to turn my Angular app into more than just an Angular app. It needs to become a Firebase app. And so to start, I'm going to Firebase init. <coughs> now it's going to walk me through this wizard. Am I ready? Of course. I, I type the command. And then here it's going to ask, what aspects of Firebase am I using? Well, in particular, I'm using Firestore and hosting. Great. <laughs> and now here it's popping up a list. It's actually inspecting all of my Firebase projects on my account and saying, which one is this related to? So here I come down and I find... Um, There it is. Ha, ah, found it. This chat devfest. It's asking what file to use for rules. That one's great. Use it. What about indexes? Use that one too. Uh, what do you want to use as your public directory? For me, I need to have this map to where my Angular output is when I run my Angular build process. So it wants to know where are those assets going to be located on your local disk. And so for me, that's going to be in dist slash let stash chat. Um, and then it asks, this is one that's super important if you're following along, do you want this to be a single page app? If this is a single page app, you don't answer yes here, it's pretty much not going to work if you have more than one route. And it defaults to no, so don't just blindly hit enter. And then apparently I have built this in the past and left it around, overwrite, sure. Alright, so I've now set up my application to be able to use Firebase, let's build my app. Again, this is a plug for my new laptop. Mac or still Windows? Yeah, doesn't matter. Really, it's not just Like, I need, I need VS Code in a browser, just in Node. Give me those three things, I'm good. As long so, as you're waiting, you have other things. That's true. All right, well, unfortunately, it beat me to it. And now I've built my app, and we can come up here and we should be able to find the dist folder and see let's chat and see that it has built out the assets so that's that's what we're after and so now I should be able to say firebase deploy hit enter and it's going through the process checking everything which is all good uploading files this is good and it worked so it then spits out and says, here's your hosting URL. And now I can copy that URL, head over to my browser, paste it, and now my app's running live. So that's it. Any questions? Oh, uh, yeah, he beat you to it. If you had a database, so you had five users, yep. they're all using the same database. When they go and you only want to return their data, do you use that callback to filter that out? Because they're still receiving it, right? And it's just chopping it out before they get it? Or is there a different function? So the answer to that question is pretty pretty involved. But you, you start using Firebase rules. There's two halves. First, you need to partition the structure of your JSON per user. And then you need to use Firebase rules to say, um, uh, and hook up a... a you hook it up so that it says anyone trying to access this subtree must have the right, right credentials, meaning that if you access this subtree, if your name doesn't match this part of the subtree, you're not allowed to access that data. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned the data store, but what if I want to consume the RESTful API? Yeah, so um, the database itself doesn't expose um, any of the data inside the Firestore with any kind of API in front of it, other than the Firebase API. If you need something more complex, like query together and bring together multiple pieces of data within your Firestore, then you would utilize what Chris had, which was those Firebase functions, and those actually gain access to, because they're part of the same project, all the data inside Firestore. And because that's all on the other side of the firewall, there's no security rules other than making sure the requester is allowed to see that particular 
chunk of data that you're preparing for them. Yeah. So Firestore is in beta. How do we see like what is on the roadmap towards like the rest of our features? Um, so for instance, I'm curious about like what or queries ever making. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, that'll never happen. Uh, okay. um, or, or queries will never happen. Roadmap, you just got to look on their NPM sites for their various packages and modules. They keep, um, keep it up to the Ish. Like, they're, uh, they're still trying to figure out what the long-term goal is. Okay. Um, it's going to be around forever because it's a super popular um, mobile platform. So it's a really great service for them, making them a lot of money. Uh, everything I did was similar to Chris. It was free. Um, only thing is, is that you pay for the usage. And so um, you have to have like a ridiculously high bar of usage before it even matters. But if you're doing that, then you better have a business model in place to capture revenue off, off of that. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's in any kind of harm. You know, it's not in harm's way, but it's still unclear what their long-term goals are in terms of growing it out. Um, I suspect it's not gonna change much because they've got different similar technologies already in the Google Cloud uh, marketplace, well, product space that lets you get different kinds of functionality like that. Um, really, this is best suited for applications where your data can be well partitioned and the majority of it can be loaded into memory as needed within that partition. If you're trying to do like big cross sectional analytics, not, not the right solution. Yeah. Well, that, that's kind of my question is someone from a more traditional SQL background that doing the ordering in memory. And the implications of that later is kind of scary to me. Yeah. If, I, if, if there's a year's worth of messages in this, is it really going to fetch all the past year of those and then try to order in memory? So as design, yes. Um, but the just number one premise of using Firestore is that you have to have a data structure that keeps that in mind. And so you're going to want to partition your data in the JSON structure in a way that doesn't have you trying to fetch so much into the browser at once, that's going to joke. But yet you just have to plan for that up front with your data model. Okay, I'll come back. Um, when, you, when you start ordering the messages, is that the mm -hmm. with the, the client side of the stuff? Is there a way to have the server side? Because client sides might not be synchronized. Um, it could be very long. Yes, not with the tools I show. So the answer would be you set up a Firebase function, you have a hook that says, when a new message was created, modify the message with my server side timestamp. Yeah, that would be run server side, so that would be there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I think you showed some uh, code in the um, Angular. Um, mm -hmm. I'm from a React background. But uh, my question is that um, does this, uh, it's a TypeScript, right? Yes. So does it like, is there another architecture for uh, TypeScript NestJS? Um, so, so the for client side in particular, Firebase actually has just a plain Jane JavaScript API, and so that way you can still call many of the same kind of method calls I was calling, like referring to a collection and adding new value. You can do that with their plain JavaScript API. The difference here is that this was set up to take advantage of Angular's dependency injection. So that if I wanted to test this application, I could put some sort of mock object in place for Firestore and be able to test my component, um, just kind of using the Angular tooling. In lieu of that, you can just use fallback to the Firebase JavaScript API and deal with like whatever library or Fire Framework specific nuances are needed to be able to isolate, test, etc. Around that, um, backend wise, let's say you want to add this, but you actually are running your backend on something other than Firebase functions, there's actually a Firebase admin um, SDK that you can plug into if you're using JavaScript. So you can look into that as well. So my question actually was, uh, does the Angular go along with the NestJS? I'm not sure of this. So, so um, NestJS being the, it's a, it's a framework. Like the framework. back end TypeScript framework for that looks a lot like Angular. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's nothing stopping you from using it together, but the whole idea would be that if you're going to go down this route, you wouldn't be using an additional backend. Oh, right. yeah. Could you share the GitHub that Yeah, it's, um, I'll, I'll write it down here so I can get out of the way and let the next person plug in. But it's um, github.com slash dps3 
slash let's dash chat. And that one has a little bit more. It goes on to include showing how to sign up a new user um, and then having that user log in, you know, like hide and show the right view based upon the logged in status. So you might need to go flip a few more switches in Firebase to make that work. All right. Thanks, everyone.